Hi children, welcome to Ictit Learning. So this is the first video I will be discussing uh, about uh, this Olival Pass papers. So in this uh, playlist, I will be talking about uh, different uh, Olival Pass papers. So usually I will be starting uh, with uh, the 2020, but in uh, my classes, I will be doing it the other way. I will be starting with the old past papers and will be ending with the latest. But in this time, I uh, plan to start with 2020 paper because um, Olival exam is very near, so this discussion would be uh, some kind of a help for you. So if you haven't watched my previous videos, uh, you can watch uh, them separately. There are a playlist for each grade uh, where I will be discussing the textbook as well as the workbook. So um, in this one, there will be actually a few parts of, for this paper discussion. So MCQs, I, I will plan to do it in two videos for 2020. So um, my recommendation is uh, first you take this past paper, do it yourself and get a marking scheme and mark yourself because in this uh, video, my target is uh, not to uh, discuss uh, what are the answers like for the first question, the answer is one, not, not that one, right? So I will be discussing the knowledge areas related to those MCQs. Why this knowledge area is very important is uh, because you should also worry about the knowledge area, not the particular question, not the particular answers. So if you read an MC, read an MCQ uh, in any subject, if you don't understand the question, if you don't understand the knowledge area, please go back and refer your books and then only come back and do it. Because if you improve your knowledge areas day by day by doing past papers, then your particular level paper will be very easy. But if you just spend time to do the MCQs and get the answers, that won't improve anything of you, right? So you have to improve the knowledge areas of these questions. Okay, uh, so the you know MCQ is for about one hour. So you have 40 questions to answer. And when you read easy questions, don't spend unnecessary time for that because if you spend so much time for the easy questions, definitely uh, you will have less time for uh, questions which need more time, like to do mathematical stuff, uh, like for the pseudo court questions, it will need some more time. So don't spend unnecessary time uh, for the easy MCQs, right? Okay, we'll start with the first question. Uh, which of the following contains only input devices? So uh, because this is the first paper discussion we are doing, I will quickly uh, recap you about uh, the uh, input and output devices, right? So uh, this is from actually grade 10, chapter two. Uh, so what are input devices, right? Input devices are used to fed data and instructions to the compute. And output devices are uh, used uh, when you uh, process the information and when you produce the processed information, uh, we use different output devices to uh, give, it, give it back to the users. So when it comes to input devices, we have actually uh, five different categories in your textbook. A keyboard, we learn about keyboard, the different types of keys and what are the different uh, layouts of the uh, keyboard, right? And then we talk about pointing devices not only mouse, right? We have so many pointing devices like touchpad, trackball, joystick, touchscreen, where you can see in the mobile um, phone. Actually, uh, this one we can consider as input and output both because uh, it provides both uh, facilities for us, right? And we have light pen and track point. Then we discuss about uh, imaging and video input devices, right? How can we get, uh, get uh, give uh, image related or video related inputs, right? So from digital camera, web camera and CCTV. Then comes the scanners, right? Scanners we used when we have a printed document and when we want to convert it to a digital image, we use scanners, right? So a uh, flatbed scanner is uh, one of the um, scanners and we have barcode readers, MICR, OCR, OMR, uh, these kind of um, scanners. I will be discussing these things in a later question, uh, but for now, we'll just remember these things were mentioned. And uh, input device, another one is microphone, mic, right? To give the sound input. Then we have the output devices. Um, 
when it comes to output devices, uh, we can divide it. Uh, it's soft copy providing, hard copy providing, and sound related output devices. So what do you mean by soft copy? Soft copy means that your output is uh, not uh, touchable. It cannot be touched. It's intangible. You cannot touch your output, right? So for example, the monitor, the output given by the monitor, you cannot touch it. You can see, it, but you cannot touch it. So when it comes to the monitors, we have CRT, we have LCD, we have LED monitors, and in another ones are projectors. So actually in your textbooks, uh, you have these overhead projectors, slide projectors, and multimedia projectors. Uh, if you uh, remember in grade 11, we discussed these things. So then comes the hard copy, like you get a paper output where you can touch the output. So uh, printers and plotters come under that, right? So when it comes to printers, we again uh, discuss so many things under printers. Hope you remember we have impact printers and non-impact printers. So you should know what is more noisy, what is more costly, right? Uh, so those kind of um, uh, knowledge you should have under this. So under sound output, you can think of speakers and headphones, right? So based on that knowledge, right? Uh, if you read the answers, right, what are the input devices we have to worry? That's the main thing, right? Uh, so you have multimedia projector, right? Uh, so then this first answer you can directly remove because it's an, a soft copy providing output device. Printer, that's not the answer. Monitor, that's not the answer. So definitely your answer should be fourth one, right? Because without even reading, you can get it. You have mouse, keyboard, light pen, and joystick. So that is your answer, right? Second one, the three main uh, functions of an information system. So this is a very direct question. Don't spend so many time, so much time. Uh, so you know any information system is having three main functions, input, process, and output, right? So it's very direct thing. For example, uh, you can uh, Take us like how in a bakery how it works. Hope you remember the discussions we had. So what are the inputs we have? We have ingredients, we have labor, we have time, right? We have resources. People are working. So those are the inputs. What are the ingredients? You will have flour, sugar, baking powder, uh, water. Those kind of ingredients to uh, make the bakery stuff, right? Then you process it. You prepare the dough. You put it to the oven, right? You bake it, right? They, uh, you, then you let it to cool. So those kind of processes there. And finally, output is the bakery items like that. So in any system, not only information system, you can see this input process output thing. And in computer, definitely we have input devices, we have processing devices, we have output devices. In addition, uh, we have storage devices as well uh, to support this whole thing. Third question, which of the following represents uh, the unit of, units of measures of data in computer systems in the ascending order of their size. So remember this bold thing is very important. Students sometimes miss this, right? Ascending from smaller to big, right? So before uh, going for the answers, we'll quickly remind what they actually uh, uh, checking, right? What is the knowledge area? So this is from uh, grade 10, uh, chapter three, right? So I uh, hope you remember bit is the smallest unit in the computer storage, right? We can represent either with zero and one, right? Then if you have eight bits, we have one byte. Nibble, Nibble is not very famous one, but it is about four bits, right? Then we have kilobyte, right? Like we have grams, kilograms, like that relationship. Now here not thousand, but it's 1024 because we are worrying with binary number system two to the power 10. So if you have 1024 bytes, we have a kilobyte. And if we have 1024 kilobytes, we have a megabyte, giga, tera, peta. So that's how the relationship works, right? So um, hope you remember this chart very easily. So this, if you understand this, any conversions from uh, one unit to another also very easy. It's not very hard. So based on that knowledge, we'll go back to the question. So what is the starting thing, right? What is the starting thing? Bit. So if you see this one, we can check, wait, don't be hurry, bit, byte, kilo, 
Terra. Yes, this is according to the sending order. The same thing I discussed. Don't look at the other answers and uh, just waste your time. If the first answer is correct, that's it. Because uh, remember, uh, when I'm doing all of us, right, um, I had time to recheck this. So I completed 40 questions. I didn't have IT when I'm doing all of us, but um, for the MCQs, I had time to recheck. So you also quickly do this and come back and recheck, right? That's, that's a good process. Next thing. Which of the following shows the storage devices of a com desktop computer in descending order? See, descending order, very important, right? So uh, for that also we have a knowledge area, a direct picture from your textbook. Hope you remember this, right? So hope you remember when it comes to the data storage capacity, uh, registers are very small amount of capacity because they are very expensive, but it has high speed, but registers are very small in capacity, right? Then cache memory, right? Then hope you remember CDs, DVDs, right? Those memories like uh, this range, right? It's about 700 MB, you can remember. Uh, so if for the both sides, for the DVDs, you can have 4.7 or 9 GBs, right? See, now this is KB, very small. But these are with MBs and GBs, right? Then comes the RAM, right? Then the ROM, right? Then you have this hard disk. And now can you see the magnetic tape is uh, having high capacity, but the speed is very low. Hope you can remember, right? So hard disk as uh, the secondary devices are coming under this area, right? So if you go back to the question, right? This is talking about descending order. So registers should come in the back of the answer. So this is wrong, actually. Now there's something, we'll go and see hard disk. Okay, RAM K middle. Okay, registers, yeah. Descending order, so answer should be the second one. No need to actually worry for the other answers. Now these ones, registers are in the middle. No, registers were in one of the extremes, right? So that is not the correct one. And here, Cache memory is it is also near to the registers. Registers, cache memory. Hope you remember what is cache memory, right? So cache memory, it's near to the process. One is like in, you remember level one, level two, level three, like that. We have cache memories, right? So um, those are having lesser capacity than the uh, hard disk. So this is also wrong. Don't worry about the other answers. You got one answer there, right? Fifth one. Which of the following are true about the secondary memory of a computer, right? So um, before that, we'll quickly uh, go for the knowledge area, right? So secondary memory, right? This is a nice graph you can see, nice picture, nice image in your textbook, right? So what is secondary memory, right? Secondary memory actually stores all your data and information permanently. It is not volatile, right? It is not uh, erased when you switch off the computer, right? It's called as external storage as well. So I uh, hope you remember uh, when it comes to the storage devices, it's internally also there. Some are portable stuff are also there, right? So uh, as I told, secondary memory uh, is non-volatile memory and it does not erase when you switch off or when you not provide electricity. So when it comes to the secondary uh, storage, we have magnetic media, optical media, and solid state devices, right? There are three types of technologies they use, right? Magnetic media, hard disk, floppies, we don't have much today. Magnetic tape, also not much, but uh, it has high capacity, if you remember the diagram. And we have optical media under that, CD, it's 700 MB. DVDs about 4.7 to 9 GB and Blu-ray it's about 25 to 125 GB range, right? And we have solid state devices where there is no any moving heads like the USB, this pen drive and the memory cards, right? Okay. So with that knowledge, we are talking about secondary memory. Data is not erased when, if the computer is switched off, yes. Correct, right? It's a correct 
right? Uh, solid state devices are can be used as secondary memory, yes, right? Secondary memory is part of CPU memory, no, no. Secondary memory is something else. It's not primary memory, right? CPU related memory means like primary memory, right? Which uh, CPU, uh, the processor can directly access. So that means your answer should be A and B only, fifth one. So always when you're doing these kind of questions, mark it with a pen, because uh, for example, think you read the first one, you just put it to your head. Second one, you read it, put it to your head. And suddenly some disturbance happened. Nearby student asked something from the teacher. So then you got a disturbance. Then you have to go back again from ABC because you don't remember the uh, correct, whether it's correct or wrong. But if you put a take, you have already done that. So you just have to worry about the uh, C part. So that will save time without knowing B, right? So some of the things are better to write and uh, do. And especially if in the mathematical uh, questions, you do the uh, rough work nicely and neatly, right? Because it will actually give you the correct answer, plus it will save time. Right? Not unnecessary uh, neatness is needed, but you have to do it the uh, proper way. Sixth one, right? Which of the following statements are correct regarding the generations of computers, right? Okay. So um, before that, we'll quickly jump into the knowledge area, right? Uh, so when it comes to the generations of the computer, first generation had vacuum tubes and they had machine language, language and they had uh, the UI as the CLI. CLI means command line interface where you have to type everything. It's text-based. No pointing devices are used. Only keyboard is the input you can use. But in the first generation, we didn't have keyboard. That's a separate story. But I mean, in the command line interface, we can use only keyboard as the input. Right. Uh, generation two had transistors, right? And the language used is the assembly language and some kind of high level language also used. Both are mentioned in your textbook. So what is actually um, machine language? Machine, machine language means you have ones and zeros, but assembly language has some kind of English words in it, right? Like add, okay, that uh, keywords are there. And high level languages are more towards the English language so it's very easy right uh, so like c sharp java pascal those kind of uh, new uh, high level languages right and here also in the second generation we had this cli command line interface but third day generation right so earlier vacuum tubes was actually replaced with transistors but using the transistors itself they compressed it and they prepared integrated circuits and here we have high level language and we have graphical user interface there right uh, where uh, the, it's uh, very easy to do the communication right we remember windows icons menus pointers those things so uh, those things were in the graphical user interface where you can use mouse and other point devices as the input device. And in the generation four, uh, microprocessors came into play and uh, high level language are used and we have the graphical user interface. So hope you remember when uh, generations are moved on, right? The power consumption became less, right? Heat generation became less, cost became less, size became less, right but the performance the speed increased right so that's the thing you have to remember so we'll go back to the question right transistors were introduced in the first generation wrong it was actually uh, vacuum tubes second one right high level programming languages are used in um, second and third generations yes we saw it, right? Operating systems with graphical user interfaces, GUIs have been used in fourth generation. Yes, it was in third as well, but fourth also, yes, they are not telling only used in uh, fourth. So definitely answer should be B and C. That means this one, very easy, isn't it? 
Okay, next one. Kamal City accessed the official web portal of government of Sri Lanka to get details about the government web directory. Which of the following services are obtained by Kamal City from the Sri Lankan government web portal? So for this one, they are testing the knowledge area. This is from again, grade 10, first chapter. Uh, so this is about um, e-governance. Right. So when it comes to e-governance, you have to remember this G2C, G2G, G2B, G2E. Right. That means government to citizens, government to government, government to business, and government to employees. If I give a small example, government to citizen, like the vehicle license renewal, that process you can think of. And G2G, government to government. Right. Uh, for example, um, the government law is mentioned there, right? And the visa information, those things are important for the government to government. G to B, business related, right? For example, how to do a business registration, right? Those things are important for a business, payment related uh, stuff, tax information. G to E, government to employees. These gassets, circulars, right? Lawn facilities for the government employees. So those things are for G to E. So that with that knowledge, right? We'll go back to the question. This is about Kamal City, right? So definitely it's not G to G, right? And G to B, no mention of businessman story, right? A G to C and G to E, no mention of employee related information. Also, he just go and get some details about a government web uh, directory. So it's just a citizen as a citizen. So G to C. Okay, next one. Which of the following contains examples uh, for the operating systems, right? So we'll quickly go back to the knowledge area and see, right? So this was also from grade 10, chapter five, right? Uh, there were uh, different mentions about operating systems, right? We have Windows operating system, right? And we have uh, Apple Mac operating system, right? So we have not only uh, Mac, we have iOS, tvOS, iPadOS, watchOS, like that different operating systems for the uh, Apple related devices. And we have Ubuntu. Right. And we have Android operating system under Google, right? Under Google, we have Android and Chrome operating system. And we have BlackBerry OS, which is not mentioned here. And under uh, Linux uh, distributions, we have actually Ubuntu, uh, Fedora, Debian, like that. And uh, regarding this Hantan Linux, so it's uh, it's one of the things uh, uh, produced by Sri Lankans, like we changed the Linux code and did the improvements on it. And we have Isru Linux, Red Hat. So these are different kind of operating systems we have, right? So with that knowledge, we'll go back to the answer. It's not very hard question. Don't spend at least one second for these kind of questions. Android, Ubuntu, Windows 10. Yes, that is operating systems. Why these answers are all wrong? Because they have Windows Explorer, which is a web browser. It's not an operating system. It's a web browser which is an application software, which is help you to browse internet. Okay. Okay, we'll go for the ninth question. Uh, which of the following statements are correct? Right? Okay. Uh, this is about uh, user interfaces, we'll quickly go for the knowledge areas and see. I discussed similar things early in the earlier question also. We have two types of uh, user interfaces mentioned in your textbook. We have CLI, command line interfaces, uh, where you have to type all these commands and you have to remember these commands and you have to use the correct syntax, right? Right here, say time and you get the time, current time. Date, you get the current date, right? Something like that. So we cannot use any um, pointing devices. We have to use text based, so it should be only keyboard related. But graphical user interfaces, right? Almost all the OSs now have this kind of UI, right? Where you can use mouse or maybe fingertips like in the touch screen to do the command navigation. So it's very easy 
and to interact uh, these kind of computers and uh, hope you remember about um, the main components in a GUI, WIMP, windows, icons, menus, and pointer, right? So if I go for a picture, uh, this is more clear as well. Hope you remember WIMP because in these are knowledge areas you should uh, refresh, right? So in this question, they're asking which of the following statements are correct? First one, a graphical user interface provides the facility to use the mouse to execute the commands. Yes, we discussed this. WIMP stands for Windows Icons Menus Pointers. Yes, it's correct. Right? This one correct, this one correct, right? And the third one, C. A command line interface is more user-friendly compared to a GUI. No, no, no. That's a bit hard, right? So the answer is A and B. So the answer is third one. Okay, next one. Assume that you are the leader of a team assigned to develop a new information system for your school. Which of the following techniques can be used to identify requirements for this system, right? So how to gather requirements? So this is from uh, grade 11, uh, chapter two, right? about uh, the system development life cycle, the first phase of it is the identification of requirement. Because you may have an existing manual system or you are going to be uh, going for a new system itself. So anyway, uh, before uh, implementation, before you design, you should know what are the requirements of the system. Right? The developer should collect this information. In real life, you have something called business analysis uh, to gather all these uh, information. So anyway, how to gather the requirements? That's the most important thing. So there are a few methods you can follow when you want to gather information, like observation. Right? You observe. You, uh, you uh, maybe go to the existing site and you stay there, right? Because uh, you, uh, you check what really happens. Right? And the interviews, you interviews with the relevant parties. You know, if you're going to implement a library system, you can uh, interview uh, your librarian, students, right? The people who are using, teachers, if it's a school. So like that, you have to do interviews, right? Then come the questionnaires, right? You uh, put questions, you give surveys and collect the answers, right? And uh, sometimes uh, documents, reports, Right, maybe the library cards, the reservation reports, you can uh, check them and prototyping, right? So uh, a kind of a model or a prototype of the system, you uh, give it and uh, demonstrate to the staff and to get the feedback. If you have something like this, how it works, maybe some just some screenshots. Okay, if your library system is like this, is it user friendly? Is the uh, navigations, the buttons and all, is it the easy for you? Right, like that, you can uh, do this prototyping method as well. So in this one, they're asking, what are the techniques? All three. Now, if you see the answers, observation, interviews, and prototyping. Very easy question, isn't it? So don't spend all the 10 questions we had. Very easy and don't spend unnecessary time. No uh, calculations, no logical thinking was needed. Just they are checking theory. So first 10 questions, very easy. Quickly, you can do it. Eleventh one, which of the following is the correct order of activities in the software development life cycle? Again, from the same chapter as the previous, right? Hope you remember the system development life cycle. We have requirement identification, design, code, right? Or the implementation uh, and testing and debugging. Then you deploy the system right, to the live environment, and then you do the main tenants, right? So that is how the system development process will happen, right? So maintenance means when the system really goes live, there will be still bugs, there will be issues, there will be performance issues. So those things you have to cater, right? So in this one, they're asking the correct order. So first thing is the requirement gathering. So uh, first answer itself, you can ignore only these three will be remaining. And you know, final thing is the maintenance. So second one also you can ignore by looking at the last answer like that you 
quickly omit the answers right then it's very easy now we'll go for the third one and check b requirement identification design uh, implementation uh, test and then you deploy and then you maintain yes correct this is correct okay because here it is d and a mixed up uh, deployment comes first before the implementation no no that's wrong right so 11th for the 11th one third answer 12th one right this is a bit tricky one right uh, excel something a uh, bit hard for most of the students so this will take some time okay no worries spend some time here because we have saved from 12 questions we have saved some time right in the given spreadsheet segment cells a1 and b1 display two values 40 and 50 respectively after entering a formula so this is the formula can you see there's a absolute reference right to the cells c1 it display the value 90 no worries and if you copy the same thing for the c2 and d1 now the order is very important first copying to the down and then copying to here what will be the values displayed in cells c2 and d1 respectively so before that uh, we'll uh, go for the knowledge area right so i uh, hope you remember uh, in excel if you uh, copy the uh, formulas right uh, from one cell to another usually this will be changed with the fill handle you can change it right so we call it as re uh, relative uh, reference right so but if you use the dollar sign right it becomes absolute right so you can make a row number or a column number absolute by making the dollar sign in front of that so for example if you have just h2 it's a relative cell reference so when you copy this to another one the whole both like based on the uh, whether you are copying horizontally or vertically either column or the row will be changing right and um, in here the row is absolute with the cell reference absolute cell reference here the column is with column absolute at cell reference but here you can see the dollar sign in front of column and the uh, row both so it has uh, absolute uh, cell reference for row and column both right okay we'll discuss more now usually what happens is in excel now if you have a1 b1 like this if you copy this uh, formula horizontally like this what will happen is your row number is not changing, right? Only your column numbers are relatively changing because this whole thing is relative, no dollar signs. So if you copy the same thing, A1, B1, both the column headers will change accordingly like B1 and C1, C1 and D1, like that it will change, right? Uh, but if you copy downwards, what happens is, right? Your row numbers are changing. Can you see one, one? two two three three but the column headers are not changing so what you have to remember is in excel if you copy the relative things horizontally your column headers will change vertically uh, it will change the row numbers that's the whole relative thing right but if you have uh, absolute for the now see here the row headers are absolute row the like absolute row cell reference right here in front of row number you have so i told you when you move it this side column letters only change okay columns letters are changing then that means here columns will change yes b a b become b c c d but anyway even without the absolute reference this side horizontally the row numbers are not changing so you don't have to worry but this side downwards i told you okay usually if it's relative row numbers will change but as i put absolute row reference here it is not changing anyway column headers don't change when you do it vertically so only changing matter is the row numbers but i put it absolute way so it is not changing same thing that's the second method third one 
I am putting absolute reference for the column header. So I told you when you move this way, right? Columns usually change. If it's relative, it's change. But here, as I put absolute cell reference, it is not changing. Can you see? Anyway, row numbers don't change horizontally. Downwards, usually what changed was the row numbers. Now the absolute reference is for the column headers. So anyway, it's not changing. Even you have relative, it's not changing. So A, B, A, A, B, A, B, that's it, right? Third way, like row and column absolute cell reference. Can you see the dollar sign is in front of both column and row, right? So I told you usually relative manner, this side columns will change, but as now it's not changing, same thing. Anyway, row numbers are not changing horizontally. Uh, vertically, I told you, Usually row numbers will change, but as I put absolute thing, it's also not changing. So same thing, understood? So we'll go back to the question with that knowledge. This is uh, some tr tricky one. Now uh, the formula is this, right? So it has only row absolute cell reference. So when I copy down, I told you when you go down, the row numbers will usually change, right? But here, as I put the absolute reference for the row, this is not going to change. You have the same thing as above. So your answer is the same as 90. So the first answer will be 90. There are three answers. We have to go for the other one. In this side, I told you when you do it horizontally, what happened is uh, column headers will change accordingly. So A, B will change to B, C. So you have B dollar one, C dollar one, B dollar one here, C dollar one here. So that means 50 plus 90 is 140, right? So the answer is this one. Hope you remember how to get it, right? If you don't understand, pause here, go back to the my explanation from the beginning and check whether you can get it, right? Don't skip. Right, because uh, if you get MMCQ in 2021 also, uh, don't leave it, right? Get it understand at this point and next time you can score. 13th one, very easy one uh, compared to the previous one. Uh, you consider the following spreadsheet segment with few components, right? Uh, before that, let me quickly uh, go for the knowledge area. So this is directly from the textbook, right? So this is Excel, right? Hope you remember, usual things are there like the title bar, ribbon, right? Those things, hope you remember the control buttons, right? To close, maximize, minimize, right? Help, those are common for even uh, for Word. But Excel, special things like active cell, the highlighted cell, we call it as active cell. And this one is to insert functions, Right, right. Uh, so this is to insert function and you have the formula bar here to insert it, right? And can you see, it's not very clear the image. You have the column headers, you have the row headers here, this side, right? And here you can see the name of the cell, active cell, the name can be seen here, right? And you have a uh, worksheets tab here. You can go for sheets, usually uh, three sheets will come, right? Uh, these vertical score, scroll bar, horizontal scroll bar, those are very common for other uh, like window, words, uh, word as well. Uh, so main important things I have discussed, I think. Yeah. So they are asking uh, P, P, what is P? This active cell, right? So all these three answers are correct, right? Then check next one, P, Q, what's Q? Row headings, okay. Both of these answers are correct. Then go for R, R is what? Column headings, so answer is the second one. We'll check the last one also if you want. S is the insert function. You insert function, this is your formula bar. Okay, next one. Uh, which of the following statement or statements is are correct? or a cell range given C to E5 in a spreadsheet. 
So um, let me quickly uh, revise you the knowledge area, right? So when it comes to the range of cells, there are three ways you can uh, tell how this is declared, right? The first thing is like this across a column, right? So here the cell range you tell like this B2 uh, to B5. So this cell range consists the cell ranges in a column, right? You start with B2 and ends with B5, right? Second method is a range of cells in a row. For example, here you can tell uh, A3 to C3, A3 to C3. So A2, A3, sorry, B3 and C3 like that. That's the second method. Third method is like this. You tell B2 to C4. It's like a cross diagonal kind of, right? Across the thing. So it will have so many cells. Can you see here? We have B2, B3, B4, C2, C3, C4. All the cell ranges are included in if you tell this way. So in your question also, they have given similar thing like this. They told C2 to E5. So shape is a rectangle and how many rows? You have four rows, three columns, right? And how many? All together cells, 12 cells. We'll go back to the answers. Total number of rows is three. No, no, it was four. Geometric shape of this cell range is a rectangle. Yes, correct. Right, it's correct. Total number of cells in this range is 12. Yes, it's true. So the answer is B and C only. Uh, last one. Right, very easy. 15, which of the following statements are correct regarding the different types of projectors? Okay, and not only multimedia projector, we have so many, three projectors actually discussed in your textbook. This is the overhead projector, right? What happens is you put a pre, uh, like uh, transparent sheet here, so you can uh, point it just to a wall or something kind of. This is a slide projector. So can you see some slides here? You can put some slides here and show like image uh, you can show. So this is a description, right? Uh, the overhead pro uh, projector, right? The transparent sheets used in a overhead projector, usually it had to be pre-prepared, right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, you, while you are doing the presentation also, you can, um, Prepare the notes while you're doing it. You can write with a pen. Notes can be written on the transparent sheet itself also. So there are two ways. Either you can pre-prepare it or while you're teaching. Now, when I'm doing and when I was doing chemistry, our teacher used similar thing at in the class. So she wrote, she drew the diagrams on the, this uh, transparent sheet. So it was projected, right? So uh, the content after you are, when you prepare it, content of the sheet, if, if you prepare it, after that you cannot erase, right? That's the thing. Cannot be erased and used again, right? You have to get another new transparent sheet. That's it. And remember, in this method, you cannot use audio video inputs, right? So nowadays we don't use these things much, right? And second thing is the slide projector, right? Here, what happened is uh, you have to uh, take some images from a camera or something and you prepare it a lab and you prepare it into slides, right? Then you put these slides into this uh, project in this tray, can you see? And then you can project it. So here also you cannot include any audio video stuff, right? But nowadays, most common thing is the multimedia projectors because uh, here you can prepare a presentation Right, and uh, you can include uh, any multimedia like video, audio stuff, animations, those uh, very attractive things as well. And uh, you can change the content even while you're doing the presentation. If, if some mistake you see, you can quickly go and change the content. So uh, that is why uh, multimedia project is more popular. Earlier days it was bulky, but now it's becoming uh, small and handy. Right, so uh, this is about the multimedia project. So with that knowledge, we'll go and see the answers, right? 
transparent sheets used in overhead projectors always have to be pre-prepared. No. While you are doing the presentation, also you can use a pen and write it on there. So not a must to prepare. So it's wrong. Images can be included in the slides used in a slide projector. Yes. Project sorry, electronic presentations made using a computer can be displayed through multimedia projectors. Yes. That's what we talk. So it's B and C. Sixteenth one. Someone has a collection of properly formatted documents prepared using Microsoft Word and LibreOffice Writer. So both are word processing software. One is proprietary where you have to pay for the license. And the second one is open source software where you can freely download and use. So he did formatting using two different word processing uh, softwares, right? Okay, formatting means like you bold, you italic, you make some font colors, font sizes are changed like that. You do some formatting, right? Um, he needs to save those documents without any formatting in order to proofread, right? So what would be the most suitable text file, right? Uh, so hope you remember the file extensions, right? Uh, there are different file exemptions. So ODT uh, is basically uh, for the open document type. TXT is for the text file. Docs for the old well, latest version of word processing after 2007. Doc, doc means the older version of word processing uh, software. PDF means portable document format. So remember in a file name and the file extension is there. File name is for us, for the user uh, to identify what was the file and all to recognition purpose. And the file extension is for the OS to decide what is the software we are going to used to open it. Huh? So there are different extensions. So in this one, uh, it's actually a knowledge area collection between this plus uh, the word processing. So word processing, we learn, we can do different formattings, but you remember the text file, can you do formattings like bold, italic, those things can you do? No, if you copy some content, formatted content, and if you just copy it to the notepad, all the formattings will vanish. Please do it and see if you haven't done it. So this one, this, based on this question, someone wanted to have no formattings. Yeah, so then better to go uh, with this one. So answer is the second one, 17th one. Uh, which of the following statements are correct uh, regarding the presentation software? All right. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll go through and see, right? The animation effects can be applied only to a single objects on a given slide. No, animations, you can put it to any image, any text, any, uh, thing on the uh, onto your like uh, in a single slide remember animation and uh, transformation uh, sorry animation and transitions are different right transitions applied for slide to slide animation is for a one object or in a slide right so animation is not only for one object you can put it to all the objects in the slide okay so this is actually wrong uh, audio recording can be um included in a presentation slide. Yes, audio, video, anything you can include. It is recommended to use less than 10 text lines in a single slide. Okay, yes. Now this one, the last one actually had a small knowledge area I would love to uh, remind, right? So when you uh, think about a good quality presentation, right? Uh, because presentations are very much used, uh, not only schools and universities, in the industry also, we are using presentations much, right? Because it's very easy to present something, right? So when you're uh, preparing a presentation, it's very important to uh, consider about the number of lines or the text you include in a presentation. Now here they are telling better to have lines per slide like six to nine. Actually, in some uh, cases, it's better to have images rather than text itself. Because um, if you have so many paragraphs and uh, 
things in your slide. Now, in, don't think about this slide, uh, this presentation. This is for you to uh, grab the knowledge area and also you will think it, this slide itself has more than six lines and nine lines. So this is a different purpose, but I am talking about normal presentations when you're doing, don't put everything into the presentation. You have to talk, put some points, bullets, and you talk about it, right? And um, font size is very important also. Don't make it very small font and put large text into your slide. It's not very good. Uh, and uh, because uh, usually it's the better to keep the font size as 32 point, right? It's accepted norm. Uh, because it's very easy to read, them, right? So, um, like that, we have some uh, important things you have to worry uh, when you are doing a presentation. Um, how to include so much pictures, images, more, uh, don't the colors also you have to be worrying. So, these things I will discuss in another MCQ, but for time being, uh, remember the don't include so many text lines in your presentation, right? So B, C, correct. So the answer will be the third one. 18th one, which of the following are considered as advantages of electronic databases? So this is directly from the textbook, right? Directly from the textbook. Uh, yeah, chapter nine, right? In grade uh, 10. So electronic and manual databases. So you have manual databases, like you have files, right? and you have electronic database. So what are the efficiency, how it's efficient, right? Electronic database is very efficient. You can quickly get data and very accurate. Nobody can go and manually edit these things easily, right? And credible, right? You can have authentication and you can make sure that only authenticated users have access to these electronic databases, right? And um, very easily you can uh, change the data input order, right? Presentation. Right, easily delete unnecessary data, right? Easily update can be done, right? Now in a file system, if you want to update, you have to forget all the relevant related files manually and update everything like that. But it's very easy in electronic database because the, all these relationships in a database is kept, right? And uh, very small space is needed, right? No need of so many files and uh, those cupboards and all and less manpower and easily you can back up these things. That's the most important. If you have a set of files and if some fire gets on, it's lost, that's it. But uh, electronic databases, you can back up and uh, into different uh, geographical locations even, and you can save them. So, so many benefits, right? Having electronic databases rather than having a manual thing. Advantages of electronic databases. Smaller physical space is required, yes. Easy to obtain copies. Yes, we can easily take a copy, not like a file. In a file, you, you have to manually copy everything. More efficient in retrieving information. Yes, all three are advantages of electronic databases. Question 19 to 21. Actually, um, usually I will uh, do up to 20 MCQs, but as this uh, goes uh, up to 21, we'll uh, discuss all things together in this part, right? So a uh, question uh, 19 to 21 are based on the following database tables that are used to store data about authors, books, and books written by the authors, right? So there are three tables. Here it's author table. Can you see? We have author ID, first name, last name, right? So here author-related information are so there. Here it's book-related book ID, name, and the price of the book. Here, it's a combination of about two books, plus it has another thing called royalty share. Because if you think about author and book, right? Author can have multiple books. From one author, you can have multiple books. And um, one book, right? Uh, with the same name, similar name maybe, and similar price also, can be having a lot of authors also sometimes. Like for example, if you think about Western music, you can have so many books, so many authors for that, like that. So it's uh, uh, to manage this relationship, we have another table. We have author ID and book ID and the royalty share. Now, hope you remember or know what is royalty for author. Uh, they will get a royalty for the book 
right? So this relationship is kept in another table, right? So before jumping to that, we'll quickly go over the knowledge areas relating to this, right? Primary key, right? What's the primary key? A primary key, a column which enables to identify a record uniquely. That's the most important thing, right? It's not duplicate. Primary keys cannot be duplicate. Primary cannot be, uh, cannot be empty or null, right? So that is why in this table, accession number is uniquely identifying each of the records. So that's a primary key, like the NIC number of us, right? It uniquely identifies us, right? And in some cases, in some tables, the primary key will consist two columns sometimes, right? So because uh, two columns itself only uniquely identifies a record. For example, in here, if you just have year 2013, Captain Rashmi, not very meaningful, right? But 2013 cricket captain is Rashmi. 2013 football captain is Jalia. And it has more meaning. So can you see in this one, year and sport both are uh, primary keys, composite primary, we call it, composite primary key. So when you, you know, like in the primary key, we have to underline. So here both should be underlined, right? Okay, we'll go for the MCQ. So in this table, right, what would be the primary key of author book table? Okay, before that, in the author table, what's the primary key? Author ID. Author ID will uniquely identify each record because if I use Anil names, names can be duplicated. Names are not unique. So names with the name, first name, you cannot identify each record uniquely. But if you have the author ID, you can uniquely identify each record. So here it's the author ID. This is the primary key. In the book table, it's the book ID, which is the primary key because... Book name also, Western music, it's not unique. Price, it's not unique. But if you have the ID, from the ID, you can uniquely identify each of these records in this table, right? Then comes the author book, right? In the author book, if I just consider author ID, is it um, giving meaningful meaning for the royalty share? No. If I do both only, it's a composite primary key. Can you see? This is composite primary key. So it helps you to understand the full record uniquely. Okay, this both uh, author and book ID will give you the royalty share. And can you see this author ID is acting as the primary key, right? For this, this is the primary key of this. Right? So this is actually foreign key for this table, but the primary key for this, right? And book ID is actually primary key here, kind of the composite primary key, but acting as the uh, foreign key for another table. Can you see that one? Yes. So what would be the primary key of author book? Okay, both, right? Answer should be third one. Very easy. We have figured it out. Consider the following statements. Author ID, author table. Remember, when you are telling the columns, you have to tell the table. Otherwise, no value, right? Here, they are telling author ID. Author table is a foreign key. No, no. no. Author ID in the author table is the primary key, right? Author ID in author book table is a foreign key. Yes, it's a foreign key for this table, right? So, yes. This is correct. Book ID in book table is a primary key. Yes, book ID in the book table uniquely identify that one book ID, right? So that is true. Okay, so A, sorry, B and C, that means the uh, answer is actually the third one. Okay. Uh, who is the author of the book title Mathemati Mathematics with Fun? We have to find Mathematics with Fun. It's this record, okay, D01. Who is the author of it? D01, author is this one, 1005. 1005 means Lalit Vijay Nayaka. 
Lalit Vijay Nayak. And 21, the answer is the fourth one. Okay. So I uh, will stop here, right? I have discussed 21 MCQs, half of the paper, right? Uh, so if you uh, don't understand any MCQs, please pause it, re play and see, because don't skip and go, right? Because I want you to make sure you understand each of these knowledge areas thoroughly. So uh, please watch the next part as well. Thank you.